that, that could bring forth fruit for your kingdom, Heavenly Father. And then we think of Glenn as he comes now. Might you give him that which he needs? Thank you for his life and ministry. And I pray that we could together be strengthened in the faith as because of our having been here today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Seven verses. The first seven verses in 1 Timothy 3. This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop, then, must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. And you may be seated. I'm going to be speaking about a subject this morning that's uh, way over my head, and so um, this message, more than any other message that I've preached, which I don't preach often, but this time more than any other, I've borrowed from other pastors and teachers, and so this um, certainly is not my own idea or um, even outline. So um, we have decided as a church to... um, have an ordination for to fill the office and the role of a pastor here at this specific church. And from my own experience in the past, uh, sometimes these, um, a, a time leading up to ordination can be difficult for some, uh, some folks. Uh, in one sense, you don't want to talk about it too much for... Um, various reasons. If you aspire to leadership, sometimes you're viewed as being proud or arrogant. And if you advertise the fact that you aspire to leadership, um, you especially are probably uh, perceived as prideful. So it can be uh, a little difficult for us. And I'd like to uh, maybe erase some of those difficulties or uh, obstacles that we that we face going into an ordination, and hopefully, um, simply by talking about it, we can um, learn what the Bible has to teach us about um, a pastor. Caring for the church of God. The call to lead is an interesting study. If you think about throughout history, God has provided leaders Uh, to fill a specific time and a role for his people and the church of God. And I think it's important for us as we think about this, even in our own Anabaptist history, not to put too much emphasis on those individual leaders, but to put the emphasis on the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, the one who the leader ultimately is following. At one point in history, Saul was the king of Israel, and he was facing an enemy, Goliath. Now, it was Saul's job to protect his people. That was the king's job. And he was in his tent, uh, scared of Goliath. And David came along and offers to fight Goliath. And David was able to kill the giant. Now, we tend to see David as a great leader, one who was able to slay the giants in his life. And so we think that we as leaders should be like David. We should be able to slay the giants in our lives. And what we fail to see is the bigger story. And that is that God wanted everyone to know that there is a God in heaven. And he used David to display his power. The bigger story is that God is providing for his people. Uh, 
He is building his church, and he sent his Savior, Jesus Christ, to provide redemption for us. It's not about King Saul or King David, but it's about the King of Kings, Jesus Christ. So this morning, as we talk about pastors and the role of a pastor, it's not about pastors. It's about the bride of Christ. It's about Jesus Christ and him building his church. In the Old Testament, God called leaders in various ways. Um, Abraham, Moses, and Joshua, God appeared to them and called them. Some like David and others uh, were called by the anointing of a prophet. In the New Testament as well, there are examples of men who were called to lead, to lead the church. And I'd just like to look at a few of them. You can open your Bibles to Acts chapter 13. In Acts chapter 13, we see that men were called by the Holy Spirit. And I'll begin reading in verse 1. Now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, Manan, from a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. In this example, these men were called by the Holy Spirit. Now turn back to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1 and verse 21. So one of the men who have accompanied us during this during all the time that Jesus, that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. And they put forward two, Joseph called Barsabas, who was also called Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, You, Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. So in this passage we see that the method of the call here was the use of the lot. And we'll look at one more in Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6 and verse 1. Now in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom he will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. These they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. These men were called and appointed by the leaders of the church. And then there's Paul, who, or Saul, who was named Paul, called by a divine encounter with Jesus. Acts 9.15 says, He is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. In each of these methods of calling a leader, the church was involved. A community of believers were gathered together and participated in providing direction to the leaders who were called. Even when Paul was called by a divine encounter with God, it was helped along by Ananias, who laid his hands on Paul and prayed for him and baptized him. 
What I would like to point out is that the method of the call is not as important as the character of the one who is called. And we'll talk about this as we move along through the message. For our church family, the call to serve as pastor will come through the voice of the church by nomination. After a brother is nominated by the church, he will be interviewed by the leaders from this church and leaders from other local churches to see if the man is willing and if the man is qualified. If there are multiple men qualified and willing to serve, then the lot will be used to determine who fills the role of pastor for this church. Once the man is selected, we will give him a charge to preach the word of God, and with that, he will be considered to be an ordained minister. That is the method that we will use. Now, just to be clear again, the method is not as important as the character of the one being called. And if you think the lot holds... um, holiness or sanctification in and of itself, the lot was also used to determine an exact time to kill the Jews in Esther's day. The lot in and of itself is not holy or provide, does not provide any sanctification for the one participating in it. And if you think being ordained makes you better than anyone else, Keep in mind that Jesus taught that the leaders of the land, the political authority, the governing rulers were ordained of God. Being ordained does not make you holy or provide any additional level of sanctification in and of itself. So we will go through this process to ordain a pastor. And I would like to point out as well that As believers, we are all called to be shepherds, to be pastors, to be leaders, both men and women. We are called to follow Christ and to attract those around us to the God by leading them through our lives and our words and our deeds. So while we are looking to fill a specific position here at this church, the call is for everyone to follow Christ. The call to serve and the call to lead is for you. As followers of Christ, we lead by virtue of the one that we follow. I serve in a position at this church as deacon. Now, I am no more qualified to be a deacon than most everyone else who is here today. There are some here who are far better at being a deacon than what I am. And just because I hold a position does not make me a better person or place me on a higher spiritual plane than anyone else. And I want to be clear that you can be called to lead and you can be qualified to lead without being given a specific position. The method of selection is not what is important. Rather, it is the character of the one who is leading or filling a position. Who or what are we following? And if as a pastor we are not lifting up the Lord Jesus, we have failed. And so as we kind of move into this idea of leadership, you can tell why it's a little difficult for me as one who has a position of leadership in this church to preach on this subject, which is why I've borrowed from other pastors to protect myself a bit. Just before church, we were talking a little bit uh, about whether a deacon should actually preach. And uh, Jonas said that there are examples in the Bible of Philip and Stephen who did preach and were deacons. Um, One of them was stoned to death. And I prefer that that um, tradition would not continue. If we can have that arranged, that'd be great. But the leadership of any organization or family is important. And it affects the growth and development of the people who are in that family. The church is, of course, we know the, the bride of Christ. And because we have the um, privilege of caring for the bride of Christ, it is a great 
calling. And the life, the ministry, and reputation of a church is, is related to the leadership of it. There's a close connection and link between the moral character of a church and the church leaders. Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. To be a good leader, one must first be a good follower of Christ. So the method of the call is not as important as the character of the called. How do I know if I'm called to lead? And how do I prepare myself for leadership? And we already mentioned that if, if you follow Christ, then you have a call to lead in some way or another. So let's go back to 1 Timothy chapter 3. And we want to look at these verses. And I've uh, divided my sermon into two main sections, the call of a leader and the qualifications of a leader. And in both of these, we'll look at four points. 1 Timothy 3 verse 1 this is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. Now, before we go much further, it may be good just to point out that in the New Testament, there are five words to um, describe leadership. Uh, you'll read about elders, bishops, overseers, shepherds, and pastors. And I would think that basically these five words for leaders are um, different transliterations of the same Greek word and can be used basically interchangeably. Uh, someone has said that elders refers to the spiritual maturity of a leader. Bishop and overseer refers to the responsibility of a leader. And a shepherd or pastor refers to the role of a leader to care for the flock. So they're basically interchangeable and I don't want us to get hung up on the various titles that are used, I'll basically be using the word pastor as we go through this uh, sermon here today. So it's a worthy calling. This is a faithful saying. It's an important point, Paul is saying. It's a foundational truth. It's something we can stand on. So Paul and the early church put great value on leadership. Uh, and Paul was concerned about and preached against the decay and corruption that he saw in the communities where he traveled. Unqualified leaders of low character had crept in and were destroying the church in general, and they were a blight or a spot of reproach to the church's testimony to the world around them. Also, in the early church, it was dangerous to be a leader. You were marked, you were hunted, and you were killed. And so Paul wanted to encourage the young men in his day that it is a worthy calling. After King Saul uh, continued to disregard the command of the Lord in 1 Samuel, Samuel told him that the Lord had chosen another king, one who would seek after the heart of God. And in Ezekiel 22, God says, I search for a man who would stand in the gap for me. So the call is not based on uh, ability or temperament or maybe even spiritual giftedness, but it's based on the character. The character of a man is important as he fills this role of leadership. This is a foundational, creedal statement. If a man desires the office of an overseer, he desires a good work. It's also a limited calling. If a man desires. The Greek verb usage impl implies masculinity as you look down through the verses 2 through 6. Especially the command to be a one woman man in verse 2. The call, as I understand scripture, is for a man to lead God's people. Now, while the rule is to be filled by a man, I believe very strongly that the wife has significant influence and responsibility as well. And there are qualifications for the wives in verse 11. Even so must their wives be grave, not slanders, sober, faithful in all things. 
If the wife is unable or unwilling to support and help her husband in this position, it will be most difficult for him to fill. So the call is limited to men. And it is limited to men who, are, who meet certain qualifications of character. And the call is also not for eternity. It is a limited calling. It is for a man who meets the qualifications. If you are called and then at some point no longer meet the qualifications, you should not continue to fill that position. It is a limited calling. It is also a compelling calling. If a man desire, and this word desire stems from two Greek words, which I will not try to pronounce. The one means to reach out after or to stretch for, and the other means an inner passion or compulsion. So the leader has this compulsive desire, this inner passion that is felt so keenly that it causes him to reach out and stretch for it. And it's the idea of a mountain being formed by pressure from underneath the surface that causes the earth to rise up. It's an inner compulsion. Some reach for leadership for what it gives back to them, not from an inner compulsion or passion. And some are compelled to lead but lack teaching and direction. And these are the two, um, the two sides of the road for this position, this compulsion. Patrick Fairbairn once said that the desire is not the prompting of carnal ambition. It is the aspiration of a heart which has itself, itself experienced the grace of God and which longs to see others come to participate in the heavenly gift. We're not talking about pride or a proud heart wanting the office of leadership. Ambition for position corrupts, but desire for service purifies. Someone has once said that if you want to know if you are called to lead, quit if you can. If you are compelled by an inner desire to lead, you cannot stop leading. And it's based on the one we are following, Jesus Christ. This call to lead is also a noble calling. It's noble. It's excellent. It is high quality work. And it is the highest calling. Oversight of the church is great responsibility and a great privilege. Hebrews 13, 17 says, leaders and submit to them for they are keeping watch over your souls as one who will will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. And James 3, 1, not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. The responsibility is to lead, to teach, to pray, to feed the flock, ordain others, and serve the needs of the church. Cotton Mather, who was lived in the 17th century. He was a Puritan who served in Boston, wrote this. The office of the Christian ministry, rightly understood, is the most honorable and important that any world could ever sustain. And it will be one of the wonders and employments of eternity to consider the reasons why the wisdom and goodness of God assigned this office to imperfect and guilty man. The great design and intention of the office of a Christian preacher is Restore the throne and dominion of God in the souls of men to display in most lively color and proclaim in the clearest language the wonderful perfections, offices, and graces of the Son of God and to attract the souls of men into a state of everlasting friendship with him. It is the work which an angel might wish for as an honor to his character, yea, an office which every angel in heaven might covet to be employed in for a thousand years to come. It is such an honorable, important, and useful office that if a man be put into it by God and made faithful and successful through life, he may look down with disdain upon a crown and shed a tear of pity on the brightest monarch on earth. Caring for the bride of Christ is a tremendous privilege. We want to look now at four 
areas of blamelessness that we see in verses 2 through 7. And I think this is particularly difficult uh, to speak about and to think about because uh, blamelessness is not uh, who I am. I am not a blameless person. We are not blameless people, as we heard about in devotions this morning. But we'll, we'll get through this together. Our national culture has been reduced to moral confusion. We have decided that morality is subjective, and these are not my words. Because of their subjective nature, Americans want character without conviction, and they want morality without feeling guilt or shame. We want virtue without offense, and we want good without naming evil. Our culture demands decency without authority to insist upon it. Basically, we want to live in a moral community without any limitations to personal freedom. And sadly, the church and families of the church, we have reduced our standards to what the culture accepts. But if character is seen to be important and the central force of a strong national leader, a church leader or family leader or community leader who is a follower of Christ must possess an unshakable moral foundation from which to lead. And this is not an outward persona. This is not something we put on. A Christian leader must know a far deeper urgent, an urgent call to character. It is not a public persona and not merely a negotiation with the moral confusion of our age. We know the moral terms to which we are accountable to and are, we know the moral terms to which we are accountable to and they are revealed in God's word. Proverbs 23, 7 says, For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. The Bible reveals that character is not something we put on. It is not an outward persona, but it comes from the heart. It is a condition of the heart. The Old Testament contained many laws to show us what true character was. But the New Testament, we are called to be a church a community of character. Matthew 5, 14, Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. As leaders under God's order, whether it's in the church or community or family, a leader among friends or in the classroom or among your siblings. Followers of Jesus must demonstrate character, the character of Christ, the one we are following. In the eyes of the world, the church is a community of deep character. That's what sets the church apart from most other organizations in the eyes of the world. And a Christian leader understands the expectation of character and by God's grace, we'll mirror the character of God as he leads. We understand that just a false persona of character is not okay. These are high standards placed on Christian leaders. And by the grace of God, we will be leaders of moral integrity and character based on the word of God. Leaders, like all sinners, can find forgiveness. But forgiveness does not restore credibility, and character that is lost takes long to reestablish. Forgiveness is always available, but the individual who fails in an area of moral character can cause the light of God's church to be hid under a bushel, or worse yet, bring reproach on the name of Jesus Christ and his bride. Sin in the church is a blight or a blemish on the bride of Christ. And it mars the testimony of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. The point is that character matters. We expect character from those around us, whether it's the president or the babysitter. We want whoever is in, whoever is in charge to be filled with character. 1 Timothy 3, verse 2 then. A bishop then must be blameless, 
or above reproach. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous. At the heart of these verses is the moral character of the leader. And we can get distracted by some of the requirements or qualifications that are given here and forget that God is most concerned about the character of the individual. For instance, we can look at the call to be the husband of one wife. And we can say that as long as somebody is the husband of one wife, they fill that qualification. But it is the character, not the marital status, that God is wanting us to see. It is a man who loves only one woman, desires only one woman, who thinks of only one woman, and whose heart is only for one woman, the wife God has given him. So let's not focus on the status of the individual, but the character of a man. You can be qualified as married, but disqualified based on your lack of moral character. Paul says that you can be a courageous leader, a gifted leader, one who is called to lead. You lead with conviction and passion, and you are an effective communicator. You have the capacity to lead. But the question is, do you have the moral purity of character necessary to lead? And the enemy will attack leaders in this area of moral purity. I think historically, as we look at the blight of the churches, it has been through scandals and moral fa failures of leaders who have allowed the enemy to gain victories over the church. The enemy works tirelessly in this area, and we need to be vigilant. Blamelessness and moral character also involves temperance, sober-minded. The Greek word is, means wineless. Leaders are not to be enticed by the pleasures of senses. It has been said that overeating is the minister's sin. Overindulgence in what we ingest, whether that is food or drugs or alcohol or social media entertainment, in discouragement and difficult situations, where do you turn? Oswald Chambers, in his book, Spiritual Leadership, asked these questions. Have you ever broken yourself away from a bad habit? Before you lead others, one must master himself. Do you retain control of yourself when things go wrong? Self-control forfeits respect and influence. Do you think independently? While respecting the thoughts of others, the leader cannot afford to have others do his thinking and make his decisions for him. Can you handle criticism objectively and remain unmoved by it? A humble leader can derive benefit from petty and even malicious criticism. Then he asks, have you qualified for the beatitude pr pronounced on the peacemaker, since it is much easier to keep the peace than to make the peace where it has been shattered? Are you unduly dependent on the praise or approval of others? Can you hold a steady course in the face of disapproval? Do your subordinates appear at ease in your presence? Are you interested in people? Do you possess tact? Do you possess a strong and steady will? Do you nurse resentment or do you readily forgive? Do you welcome responsibility? Are you above reproach? Do you manifest a state of life and conduct that is above accusation? There is no blot on your life that renders you unworthy example or model of spiritual virtue. And I'd like to point out that the standard that God has for the pastor of a church is no different than he has for the people of the church. God does not want the pastor up here and the people down here when it comes to moral character. And uh, the point is that as we follow Christ, we are examples of a high standard to which others will also attain. We do not want to be on different spiritual planes within a church. A leader is not to be frivolous. It doesn't mean that he can't laugh. A pervasive sense uh, of seriousness of life is what guides his life. Philippians 4.8, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, 
whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, and if there is anything worthy of praise, think on these things. A leader is also to be orderly. The verse says, of good behavior. It comes from the word cosmos, which is related to cosmos, the ordered creation of the universe. And an ordered mind and orderly living uh, is the idea. The ministry is absolutely no place, someone has said, for a man whose life is a continual confusion of unaccomplished plans and unorganized activities. It's not chaos we're after, but cosmos, orderliness. Leaders are to be hospitable. And the idea in these verses is not to have friends over, but to be hospitable to strangers is what the Greek word refers to. And I think in the early church, when they were enduring persecution, if people traveled, they needed a safe place to stay. And so they often uh, entertained strangers in their homes. And a pastor is to be hospitable, not to be remote and unreachable and unavailable, but they are to be local. It is impossible for a shepherd to, it is impossible to shepherd a flock without being present and available. He is to be apt to teach. And I think this is the first one that even gets close to being a skill set. And this is the difference between the call of a deacon, I believe, and the call of a pastor. A pastor's responsibility includes teaching, where a deacon's is primarily serving. This is also a moral qualification. Like we already mentioned, a teacher teaches from a compulsion to lead others to Christ. He is the example to follow. 2 Timothy 4.12, let no man despise thy youth. But the key to teaching is be an example in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, and in purity. The command is given that the leader here is to be not a striker, and this is an interesting one because it means that a leader is not to go around and punch people in the face. And I believe that we can very easily make the observation and application that we as leaders are not to walk around taking jabs at people's character for no reason. But we are to be gentle and patient. And the servant of the Lord in 2 Timothy 2.24 must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who were taken captive at him by his will. Not a brawler, not quarrelsome, not contentious. Pursue peace with all men. In Hebrews 12, 14, and in Galatians 6, 10, let us to good unto all men. The leader is not to be covetous, not greedy of filthy lucre. 1 Timothy 6, 6 tells us that godliness with contentment is great gain. Covetous, covetousness causes double-mindedness, and followers will pick this out of a leader. A leader is not to be covetous. In verses 4 and 5, we're to be blameless in home life, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? I think the family becomes a proving ground for leadership skills. And I think we need to be careful that we don't rule this verse and say that one that rules his own house is what we're looking for, but one who rules well his own house. Ruling is not the end effect, but ruling well is what we are after. And this would include uh, stewardship of resources as well as the wife and family that God has provided for him. I'd like to point out here something that I've found in study very helpful for me. Ruling well has the idea of authority and wisdom and love working together. Authority that makes it advisable for his children to obey. 
wisdom that makes it natural and reasonable for his children to obey, and love that makes it delightful for them to obey. If any one of these three are lacking, we are unbalanced, and we are ruling, but we are not ruling well. And if a man is going to lead the church, he must demonstrate in the home that he can exercise authority that makes it advisable to obey, wisdom that makes it reasonable, that makes it delightful. The phrase, how shall he then care for the church of God, is the same language that we find when we read about the Good Samaritan. Care for. It starts with compassion and extends to giving time. As we think about the Good Samaritan, he gave time. He was binding up wounds. He was pouring in oil. He gave his transportation to carry him. He took him to an inn, paid his bill, and in general, took care of him. And that's what it's all about in leading a church. It's caring for, taking care of the church. He's also to be blameless in maturity, not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Novice has the idea of being newly planted or a recent convert. And in Titus, it's interesting when Paul gives a list of qualifications, he leaves this one out. And he finds himself in that passage on the island of Crete, where they were all new believers. And so there was not different levels of maturity. And so Paul did not uh, give the, the, uh, was not as concerned about a novice being ordained since they were all, in a sense, novices. But one who is a novice can be wrapped up in pride, the Bible tells us, lest he fall into condemnation of the devil. And this is not the devil going after and condemning him of his pride, but this is a person, a prideful person, receiving the same condemnation reserved for the devil. He makes the same mistake that Lucifer did and ends up with the same result. Lucifer was, in Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14, a choir director, covering cherub, the son of the dawn, son of the morning, and his pride caused him to fall into condemnation. Leadership must involve humility. And so the church is to protect itself and its good men from being lifted up too soon and falling into pride and the condemnation of the devil. This is not just a warning for the novice among us. This is a warning for all of us. The test of maturity or the standard of maturity can also be called the standard of humility. And as leaders, we need to exercise humility. We are also to be blameless in reputation in verse 7. Moreover, he must have a good report from them which are without, lest he fall into the reproach and snare of the devil. His testimony and character are verified by the community. He has a reputation in the community, a good reputation. Romans 2.24 says, For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. What a tragedy. Philippians 2.15 sums it up, That you may be blameless and harmless, the children of God without rebuke. In other words, they can't rebuke you for anything without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom you shine as lights in the world holding forth the word of life. Colossians 4, 5, walk in wisdom toward them that are outside. It is important because God, since the beginning of time, wanted those who follow him to shine the light of his grace, his love on the community around them so that they can enjoy the fellowship with the Father that we already experience. Please don't leave this place thinking that leaders are better than those they are leading. Please don't interpret what I've been saying about leaders incorrectly by giving yourself a free pass because you're not in a position of leadership. As a child of God, you are called to lead. You must lead those around you whom God has placed in your care to the Savior. You must point your friends and your neighbors to the Lord Jesus Christ. And you must do this by displaying a high level of moral character in every area of life so as to reflect 
the life of Christ. A city on a hill cannot be hid. Let your light shine so that the Father in heaven will receive glory. I want to read a poem in conclusion. When God wants to kill a man and thrill a man and skill a man, when God wants to mold a man to play the noblest part, when he yearns with all his heart to create so great and bold a man that all the world should be amazed, watch his method, watch his ways, how he ruthlessly perfects whom he royally elects, how he hammers him and hurts him and with mighty blows converts him into trial shapes of clay which God only understands. While his tortured heart is crying and he lifts beseeching hands, how he bends but never breaks when his good he undertakes, when he uses whom he chooses and with every purpose fuses him, by every act induces him to try his splendor out. God knows what he's about. The call to lead is not based on your ability. It is not based on your giftedness, but the call is obedience to God. If you are young, and you feel the call to lead, then be obedient. Live in obedience to God's word. Don't just exercise abilities and gifts, but live a blameless life. Exercise your character. Dig deep into the soil of your heart and plant a solid foundation based on the word of God. If you prepare your heart for leadership, God can and will use you in his kingdom. Will you kneel with me for prayer? Lord, I pray that you would continue to provide direction to this congregation as we approach an ordination. Help us to think through this situation according to your word. Help us to be men and women of character. Help us all to see the need uh, that you have, the call that you have placed on our lives to be leaders uh, by virtue of following uh, you and your word. Help us to demonstrate your love as we live out, uh, as we live here in the world. Help us to call our neighbors, our friends, our siblings, those around us to a higher level of living, one that follows you and your example and honors you so that in the end all the world may know that there is a God in heaven. Thank you for being with us today. Help us to honor you with our lives throughout this coming week. In Jesus' name, amen.